June 4th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Kings chapters 21 and 22 from the Old Testament. After this, the following episode took place. Naboth, the Jezreelite, owned a vineyard in Jezreel, adjacent to the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard so I can make a vegetable garden out of it, for it is adjacent to my palace. I will give you an even better vineyard in its place, or, if you prefer, I will pay you silver for it. But Naboth replied to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should sell you my ancestral inheritance. So Ahab went into his palace, bitter and angry that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not sell to you my ancestral inheritance. He lay down on his bed, pouted, and would not eat. Then his wife Jezebel came in and said to him, Why do you have a bitter attitude and refuse to eat? He answered her, While I was talking to Naboth, the Jezreelite, I said to him, Sell me your vineyard for silver, or, if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not sell you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, You are the king of Israel. Get up, eat some food, and have a good time. I will get the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite for you. She wrote out orders, signed Ahab's name to them, and sealed them with his seal. She then sent the orders to the leaders and to the nobles who lived in Naboth's city. This is what she wrote. Observe a time of fasting and seat Naboth in front of the people. Also seat two villains opposite him and have them testify. You curse God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. The men of the city, the leaders, and the nobles who lived there followed the written orders Jezebel had sent them. They observed a time of fasting and put Naboth in front of the people. The two villains arrived and sat opposite him. Then the villains testified against Naboth right before the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they dragged him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they reported to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Get up, take possession of the vineyard Naboth the Jezreelite refused to sell you for silver, for Naboth is no longer alive. He's dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. The Lord told Elijah the Tishbite, Get up, go down, and meet King Ahab of Israel who lives in Samaria. He is at the vineyard of Naboth. He has gone down there to take possession of it. Say to him, This is what the Lord says. Haven't you committed murder and taken possession of the property of the deceased? Then say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the spot where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, they will also lick up your blood. Yes, yours. When Elijah arrived, Ahab said to him, So you have found me, my enemy. Elijah replied, I have found you because you are committed to doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord says, Look, I am ready to bring disaster on you. I will destroy you and cut off every last male belonging to Ahab in Israel, including even the weak and incapacitated. I will make your dynasty like those of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you angered me and made Israel sin. The Lord says this about Jezebel. Dogs will devour Jezebel by the outer wall of Jezreel. As for Ahab's family, dogs will eat the ones who die in the city, and the birds of the sky will eat the ones who die in the country. There had never been anyone like Ahab who was firmly committed to doing evil in the sight of the Lord, urged on by his wife Jezebel. He was so wicked he worshipped the disgusting idols just like the Amorites whom the Lord had driven out from before the Israelites. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He slept in sackcloth and walked around dejected. The Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, 
Have you noticed how Ahab shows remorse before me? Because he shows remorse before me, I will not bring disaster on his dynasty during his lifetime, but during the reign of his son. There was no war between Syria and Israel for three years. In the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah came down to visit the king of Israel. The king of Israel said to his servants, Surely you recognize that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, though we are hesitant to reclaim it from the king of Syria. Then he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to attack Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I will support you. My army and horses are at your disposal. Then Jehoshaphat added, For seek an oracle from the Lord. So the king of Israel assembled about 400 prophets and asked them, Should I attack Ramoth Gilead or not? They said, Attack! The sovereign one will hand it over to the king. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord still here that we may ask him? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can seek the Lord's will, but I despise him because he does not prophesy prosperity for me, but disaster. His name is Micaiah, son of Imlah. Jehoshaphat said the king should not say such things. The king of Israel summoned an official and said, Quickly, bring Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and king Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting on their respective thrones, dressed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. All the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Kena Anna, made iron horns and said, This is what the Lord says, With these you will gore Syria until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying the same, saying, Attack, Ramoth Gilead. You will succeed. The Lord will hand it over to the king. Now the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the prophets are in complete agreement that the king will succeed. Your words must agree with theirs. You must predict success. But Micaiah said, As certainly as the Lord lives, I will say what the Lord tells me to say. When he came before the king, the king asked him, Micaiah, should we attack Ramoth Gilead or not? He answered him, Attack, you will succeed. The Lord will hand it over to the king. The king said to him, How many times must I make you solemnly promise in the name of the Lord to tell me only the truth? Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. Then the Lord said they have no master. They should go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you he does not prophesy prosperity for me, but disaster? Micaiah said, That being the case, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, with all the heavenly assembly standing on his right and on his left. The Lord said, Who will deceive Ahab, so he will attack Ramoth Gilead and die there? One said this, and another that. Then a spirit stepped forward and stood before the Lord. He said, I will deceive him. The Lord asked him, How? He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. The Lord said, Deceive and overpower him. Go out and do as you have proposed. So now look, the Lord has placed a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. But the Lord has decreed disaster for you. Zedekiah, son of Kena Anna, approached, hit Micaiah on the jaw, and said, Which way did the Lord's Spirit go when he went from me to speak to you? Micaiah replied, Look, you will see in the day when you go into an inner room to hide. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the city official, and Joash, the king's son. Say, this is what the king says. Put this man in prison. Give him only a little bread and water until I safely return. Micaiah said, if you really do safely return, then the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, take note, all you people. 
the king of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah attacked Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and then enter into the battle, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and then entered into the battle. Now the king of Syria had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, Do not fight common soldiers or high-ranking officers. Fight only the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they said, He must be the king of Israel. So they turned and attacked him. But Jehoshaphat cried out. When the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel, they turned away from him. Now an archer shot an arrow at random, and it struck the king of Israel between the plates of his armor. The king ordered his charioteer, Turn around and take me from the battle line, because I'm wounded. When the battle raged throughout the day, the king stood propped up in his chariot opposite the Syrians. He died in the evening. The blood from the wound ran down into the bottom of the chariot. As the sun was setting, a cry went through the camp. Each one should return to his city and to his homeland. So the king died and was taken to Samaria, where they buried him. They washed off the chariot at the pool of Samaria. This was where the prostitutes bathed. Dogs licked his blood, just as the Lord had said would happen. The rest of the events of Ahab's reign, including a record of his accomplishments and how he built a luxurious palace in various cities, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Israel. Ahab passed away. His son, Ahaziah, replaced him as king. In the fourth year of King Ahab's reign over Israel, Asa's son Jehoshaphat became king over Judah. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king and he reigned for 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhai. He followed in his father Asa's footsteps and was careful to do what the Lord approved. However, the high places were not eliminated. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense on the high places. Jehoshaphat was also at peace with the kings of Israel. The rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign, including his successes and military exploits, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Judah. He removed from the land any male cultic prostitutes who had managed to survive the reign of his father Asa. There was no king in Edom at this time. A governor ruled. Jehoshaphat built a fleet of large merchant ships to travel to Ophir for gold, but they never made the voyage because they were shipwrecked in Easy on Geber. Then Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my sailors join yours in the fleet. But Jehoshaphat refused. Jehoshaphat passed away and was buried with his ancestors in the city of his ancestor David. His son Jehoram replaced him as king. In the seventeenth year of King Jehoshaphat's reign over Judah, Ahab's son Ahaziah became king over Israel in Samaria. He ruled for two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed in the footsteps of his father and mother. Like Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he encouraged Israel to sin. He worshipped and bowed down to Baal, angering the Lord God of Israel, just as his father had done. God, I, <laughs> I love the story of Micaiah, because I would be that smart aleck prophet in court. <laughs> of course, I'm going to say exactly what everybody else says. It just humors me every time I read that. Um, and it's also humorous to me that the that the king calls him over and says, I want you to prophesy, but I want you to say what all the other prophets are saying. And then you can totally hear the king whine. He only ever says bad things about me. He never tells me anything good. <laughs> Anyways, I think this whole story is very humorous because of how people are reacting to your <laughs> sovereignty. And McKay's like, whatever. <laughs> 
and in my smart aleck world i sometimes <laughs> i sometimes unfortunately with my timing uh, deal with other people this way when when they say like the oddest things about faith or about you or about the bible or about christians um but then you kind of have to step back and and with humbleness uh, be a little bit sad that their heart is in such a messed up place to to be coming from such an odd place to say please prophesy but say what everyone else is saying um, that same nonsense of things that we hear day in and day out as as Christians uh, attacking our faith and attacking our relationship with you um, but I hope that at least in the future that that my humor won't overtake my sense of mercy in dealing with other people and and that in talking to them about you instead of being a brat like Micaiah was in court that, that maybe I will be able to offer them grace in my answer like you have given me so much grace in my stupid questions I have or my stupid statements I have that I will find the grace to answer them correctly um, instead of always just be a smart aleck and, and laugh at things. God, you did give me kind of a feisty side. <laughs> I just pray that I always use that feistiness for good and, and not to hurt people's feelings, but to bring truth to the world and to glorify you as well. God, I just love you so much for everything you've made so that I can do what you need me to do while I'm here on earth. In your son's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>